For the first time doing these reviews, I'm speechless. I'm utterly speechless at how unbelievably bad this movie is. And that this film even got made in the first place. And it makes me wonder, what the hell the director, the writer, the camera crew, what they were all doing behind the camera when they were making this film. I don't know what drugs they were on that that they were, or what shrooms they were even taking while they were making this film, because I don't know any normal functioning kid that would enjoy this film, because this is a PG-rated kids film, um, and it's a sequel to a film that I cannot believe is in the same universe as that film. It's a film that now when I think of bad sequels, prequels, or remakes, this movie has now earned a spot on that list. And it will be one of the many examples that I'll use when talking about that. Because this is a movie that shows, without the original ingredients, the perfect ingredients that made that apple pie from, from a long time ago perfect, that it's going to turn worse when you add new ingredients that aren't as good. It doesn't taste as good without the perfect ingredients. The ingredients that made it so perfect in the first place. And, and it said you're just adding random stuff that makes no sense. And this film proves it perfectly. And what film is that you may be asking? We are talking about... Son of the Mask. More like Stain of the Mask. Because that's the best way to describe it. It's a stain on the original movie. Good God. This movie. Oh my God. I'll get to it later. But Son of the Mask is a film made back in 2005. And it's directed by a guy named Lawrence Gutterman. Who directed Cats and Dogs. And as I said earlier. This is a sequel to... Or a follow-up, however you want to say it, to The Mask from 1994 with Jim Carrey, which that was one of the three movies that launched his career. And I reviewed that a couple of years ago. I'll give a quick recap on what I think of that film later, um, for those wondering. Uh, but as I said in my review for The Mask, it was a big hit at the box office and had a great critical reception, so the studio decided to move forward with a sequel. The announcement for a sequel came about in a the Nintendo Power issue. I'm not sure if it was a year... I think it was a year after or after a couple years after. I could be wrong. But they announced The Mask 2 was underway and that Jim Carrey was the star. And with that announcement, they also gave a contest to be part of the film. Chuck Russell wanted to come back and help the, helm the film, but... He wanted Jim Carrey and Amy Yazbeck, even though in a deleted scene, Amy's character was killed off. Chuck decided to delete those scenes because he wanted to set her up for a sequel. Um, Carrey, would, uh, Carrey was offered $10 million to do the sequel, but turned it down because of his experience during doing Ace Ventura When Nature Calls. Not that it was a bad experience, but he felt as though playing the same character in the sequel never offered any challenges, and he didn't want to do the same thing over and over again. So he turned it down, and the project was put on hold. To, um, I feel bad for the kid who won the Nintendo Power contest. I hope he's doing well now and has forgiven Nintendo Power. And plus, because of that... Um, that uh, Chuck Russell just went to do his own thing. Uh, he went on to direct Eraser. But after that, all remained silent until 2001 when Lance Kazai was hired by New Line Cinema to pen a sequel. New Line liked it and attempted to get Jim Carrey back. At first, Jim Carrey accepted, but when he read the script, he quit. I'm slurring my words. But... You could tell when an actor quits that a sequel is born to be a failure. And I think Jim knew that reading the script. Um, and once again, Chuck said no because Jim Carrey said no, along with many of the actors and actresses from the original. So they got Lawrence Gutterman. They went through many people such as Jack Black. Um, and they finally settled on one particular one. They got a few people to go get to work on the film. And the film started production back in November of 2003, and it was shot mostly in Australia. 
At some points, they had to shoot in Los Angeles, California. For the CGI, they brought back Industrial Light and Magic to help with the effects, even though their talent here has drastically been downgraded, and they also got a few other people to help. And the movie was supposed to come out in 2004, and they made a teaser trailer for it, which played during, of all movies, and I can't believe I'm saying that, this, Lord of the Rings, Return of the King. But the movie got pushed back to 2005 because they had to finish up some stuff. And shooting finished in April 2004. And it finished its and it finished itself up with a budget of 84 to 100 million. How much did the first mask cost? Twenty three million is how much the original mask cost. You can't be serious. But the movie opened on February 18, 2005, and it opened to number four at the box office, grossing only a poor, poor, well, I should say a poor, grossed only over a poor seven million. And the next weekend, it dropped to the nine, number nine spot. So it bombed big time. And I guess people knew it would be bad. Hell, hell, it even performed worse than the last Jim Carrey free sequel, Dumb and Dumber Er When Harry Met Lloyd. I'm gonna bring this film up again a little bit. But that over the 10 million. So the ship sunk big time. And it deserves it. And the movie also received extremely negative reviews from critics. On Rod Tomatoes is a 6%. Critics land based at the film for its poor and overuse of effects, unfunny gags, and the missing presence of Jim Carrey, which is a big problem. On an episode of Ebert and Roper where they reviewed the film, both of which awarded the film two thumbs down, Richard Roper was quoted as saying, In the five years I've been co-hosting this show, this is the closest I've ever come to walking out halfway through the film. And now that I look back at the experience, I wish I had. Now this, God, this movie's ticking me off so much, I accidentally tipped a bottle. My anger is going through and just showing me tipping a bottle. But Roger Ebert also awarded the film only half a star, feeling that the movie carries none of the none of the charm of the original. And he also criticized the movie for pulling for not pulling in the effects reins, and because the movie goes goes fully loaded on its effects, and saying he felt the plot feels like it goes nowhere. And one critic, Lou, Lou Lemrick, said this, and this is so true. Parents who let their kids see this stinker should be brought up on child abuse charges. So should the ratings board that let this suggestive mess slip by the PG rating. <laughs> <laughs> That's so true. They do need to be brought up on child abuse ratings. Now, I've already reviewed The Mask. I have it somewhere in there, but a couple years ago, I love that film. And that was one of the films that really put Jim Carrey on the map, as I said earlier. The story I thought was interesting. The fact that it was originally supposed to be a horror film and they turned it into a straight-up comedy was interesting. It was an interesting change. But the team made it work. Chuck Russell does a great job directing. Jim Carrey's on his A-game in that movie. The supporting cast is great. It's accompanied by great special effects, all of which were done by L I L M. This movie has none of those strengths. And this is what happens when you wait too long to do a sequel, too. And then going back to the apple pie thing, if they were going to use the same ingredients, they probably rotted by now, and they have to, and they had to get new ingredients. So they used the worst ingredients, and that's pretty much what happened. And they get a group of people who have no understanding of why the original film works so well. Feels like a five-year-old put this film together without having seen the original. But I'll dissect this dud of a film and go deeper on what makes it suck. But the first strike should be seen by our main cast of characters. For example, instead of Jim Carrey, we get Jamie Kennedy from Scream 1 and 2, uh, TV's The Jamie Kennedy Experiment. Um, he was also in Malibu's Most Wanted, which I might review in the future. You also got a uh, trailer Howard from uh, Dirty Work, uh, Me, Myself, and Irene, both better movies, and TV's Monk. You have Alan Cumming, of all people, from X2, X-Men United. He was Nightcrawler. 
He was in the Spy Kids trilogy, uh, Rami and Michelle's High School Reunion, uh, Flintstones, Viva Rock Vegas. That's a that's another prequel that sucks. Uh, Bob Hoskins is here, of all people, from Who Framed Roger Rabbit. He was also in Balto. Yes, Boris from Balto's here. The Super Mario Brothers movie is also in, which I, a film I saw recently, Unleashed, which I'm going to give a review on later. Um, uh, comedian Stephen Wright is here from Reservoir Dogs, Natural Born Killers, The Swamp Princess, and So I Married an Axe Murder. I don't know why he's here. For some reason, Cal Penn's in this from Van Wilder. Harold and Kumar go to White Castle. Why is Cal Penn here? You were funny in Harold and Kumar and Van Wilder. Why are you in this stinker? But the but thankfully we got the only cast member to surprise reprise his role from the original Ben Stein. Yay! From Ferris Bueller's Day Off at Casper. Yay! We need his emotionless voice. Oh my god. I'm giving more emotion right now than him. This movie's horrible. And I'm still questioning how Dumb and Dumber Er when Harry Met Lloyd is in the same realm of is considered to be in the same realm of bad as this movie. At least this movie has its moments. At least it respects the original. These two guys feel like Harry and Lloyd. They felt like Jim Carrey and Jeff Daniels in the original. The humor felt in the same realm. I enjoy New Gene Levy as the villain, and I found it funny. Granted, it's not as funny as the original, but 3.3 on IMDb, I think that's too low. Thankfully, this film has a 2.2. It deserves it, but Dumb and Dumber -er at least deserves a 4 or a 4.4. It is not that bad. I honestly thought, I remember when I reviewed this film, um, a couple years ago when I was in my old house, I thought I was going to get trashed for liking this film. You know, but thankfully, you guys were nice about it, so I thank you guys for that. But this is that bad? No. I got to talk about that film again, but I'm talking about Son of the Mask. Oh my god. Anyway, the basic plot of the film is basically this. We meet this guy named Tim Avery, played by Jamie Kennedy, who's a struggling cartoonist who also has to deal with the fact that his recently married wife named Tanya, played by Trailer Howard, who's desperate to conceive a child. Um, child, but Tim does not want to do this because he feels like he's, he's not right to hold that mantle of responsibility because he doesn't feel like he has the strength to do that. Uh, as that's going on, we see Loki, played by Alan Cumming, who has come down to Earth so that he can find his mask because we learn that his father, Odin, played by Bob Hoskins, now knows, now knows that the mask has been found and forces Loki to go down to Earth and find the mask. But Tim finds the mask thanks to his dog, Otis, who finds it in the lake after uh, Jim Carrey and Cameron Diaz at the end of the first film uh, threw it there. Uh, and he wears it to a Halloween party and becomes the life of the, po life of the party. He's respected by the people at the party, including his friend, played by Cal Penn, his boss, played by Stephen Wright. Um, and they also make a deal with him to make a cartoon out of the character. And he's able to conceive a child with the mask on, if you know what I mean. And because the two had... I can't believe I'm saying this. I cannot believe I'm saying this. Because the two had sex... And he had the mask on. The kid has picked up some of the mask's DNA. And what happens is Tony has to go out of town for a business trip. And it leaves both Tim, Otis, and the baby alone. And out of nowhere, the baby suddenly decides that he wants his father to go crazy and have him thrown in a mental institution. And as, that go, as that's going on, Otis gets a hold of the mask, and he suddenly decides he's going to kill the baby so that he can be the center of attention again. While we have that, Loki finds out that he has the mask and starts chasing him so he can get the mask. Will Tim be able to find the mask and give it back to Loki before he kills his family, or will Loki get the mask and do horrible things to them with the mask, considering all the power that thing has? <sighs> So many years to develop and so much potential down the toilet because this is the best they can do. They could have looked towards the comics and took some inspiration 
to make it their own movies. They did it with the first film. There's homages to the comics in there. Um, for those who don't know, the car part uh, where it, where he shoved them shoved the car parts up the guy's asses. He actually does it a lot more gruesome in the comics. Um, they could have done that. Chuck Russell did it in 19, 1994. Why can't they do that in 2005 where the technology is improved and they could take us beyond what was seen in that film? Why can't they do that today? Because for how much that was accomplished in the original, why didn't they take it in that route where they could... Where they had this mobster sort of feel with the original, and they turned it into a Looney Tunes episode. Now, granted, the original, you could say, it was a Looney Tunes episode, too, but I think the creators understood when to restrain themselves a little bit. It actually helped to give lead way to Jim Carrey to basically... play both parts. Play the mask and the Stanley character. And maybe, what's the word? This movie's giving me, I'm getting a headache just talking about this film. Oh my God, those images. But um, when he was Stanley, when he was the mask, uh, he actually was able to step into both sides. He got both sides of the character. Um, or maybe when it wasn't serious, it knew how to be serious when... It was comical in those aspects. This, though, isn't taking itself seriously. And it sets itself up in the same universe as the original. And not only portrays itself as a direct sequel, but it also breaks all the rules set by the original. Like, remember in the original how the mask only works during the night? Well, in this movie, Otis has the masks on during the day. And the movie never explains how he's able to put the mask on during the day. Does the mask rule change from person to person depending on who you are? Did Stanley miss something in the original? I don't have any answer. And the movie certainly doesn't because they think it's funny that he has the masks on and he gets this horrible thing with the baby. Because it makes for a gag with Otis and the baby. That's probably the answer. Well, the gag of itself doesn't make any sense when it breaks the rules set by its predecessor. If you're going to have a gag... At least set it in the grounds of its predecessor. The original mask, yeah, it was cartoony, but it had rules that set it in reality. This is almost completely a cartoon. And does it bother to say, you know what, let's remind ourselves that we have rules set up in the first film. And, and it just, and let's at least try to restrain ourselves. But no, instead, it just relies heavily on raping your eyes and ears with loud noises and constant flashes, which get annoying the minute the movie starts. It's not filmed with the serious, gritty, can't crime angle that accompanied the first film. It's all colorful, it always looks sunny, separating it further from the original, which is not something a sequel should do. And that's what I'm talking about earlier. The movie feels like it misses the tone the first one did so well with. I mean, why are they acting like this, that this is set in the same universe as the original, when it's not even dealing with the same themes or filmed in the same way? And I'm not saying you have to make everything the same, but don't jump from Earth to Pluto and call it Earth. It's different universes. And people also love to give shit to... Dumb and dumber about how, oh, it doesn't have the same intelligence as the original. Are we really going to bring intelligence to a movie called Dumb and Dumber? And I'll say it again, because people on the internet love to twist the words to the point where they'll make something up or put words in your mouth. I think the original's funnier, but I still like this film. And at least this was on the same universe as the original. Unlike this piece of shit. But this film feels like it's a different universe. And I'll say, it shot well. The budget's on the screen. But you could have used that money to make the film feel like the same universe. I saw this movie with no laughter of the audience. I only found one point when I laughed. And it's when Tim's getting ready to cook bre breakfast. And the baby farts. It's not because... I laughed because of the fart joke. I hate the fart joke. It wasn't funny, but it was actually the fakes J.B. Kennedy makes. 
That I laughed at. But yeah, that's what I mean. The humor is pussified in this movie. The original was PG-13. Yet it felt the delve and, and it kind of had elements of... And yes, there were stuff that kids saw, but it felt more adult. And it still felt like kids could enjoy it. This is a toned down PG rating. Jeez, Poltergeist had more guts for a PG rating than this film. But that's what I mean. The gas consists the gags themselves consist of poop jokes, like I mentioned, pratfall after pratfall, a baby urinating on a guy, and puke jokes. None of which are funny or amusing to watch. And I tell you what thing, I haven't been this embarrassed that a kid's film received a PG rating since Cat in the Hat. This movie makes Cat in the Hat look like Balto. Yes, I said it. I said it. But going back to Dumb and Dumber, people love to give shit to Eric Christian Olsen and Derek Richardson. No, look at the casting of this movie. Now, I just want to make one thing clear. I may come off hard there, but I don't hate J.B. Kennedy. I don't. I like a lot of his stuff, like the J.B. Kennedy experiment where they did that ghost ship the musical. I thought that was funny. I like him as his role in Randy and Scream. I like Scream 2. Even though I don't like where they take his character at Scream 2. Uh, I also thought um, Malibu's Most Wanted. I saw my brother and I enjoyed it again. I'll do a review of that. So I like J.B. Kennedy. And I don't want to be too hard on him, him with this movie. Because with some of the reviews, it almost seems like he gets most of the blame for the film. And he try, tries the best he can. But boy, was he the wrong choice to replace Jim Carrey. Because... When seeing this film, I sort of felt like it could be multiple reasons why I find his performance fail in comparison to Jim Carrey. Because what I saw before you see him in the mask, you see him trying to do the same thing Jim Carrey did in the mask. Like he tries to start the character off the bat as useless in the film with no with this sort of no backbone personality. But the whole angle is useless in this film because Stanley has literally well, Tim, I should say. Um, Tim, Tim doesn't have the same. Oh, what's the word? I'm trying to think of what to say. He's in the same league, I should say, because Stanley literally had nothing but his cartoons and his dog Milo. He was picked on at work by his boss and, and other people. He was cheated on a car that he wanted. His landlord was a bitch to him. And he did know how to talk to girls, so the mask was needed for him. Here, though, Tim li Tim lives in a nice house. He's got a beautiful wife. And his only problem is that he has a tough time entering fatherhood. Wow! Have you heard of marriage counseling? Because I think that'll help a lot. It just feels like a step down with the character development as opposed to the first with Stanley. Like, Stanley was developed. You followed him well. I liked how they handled the Stanley character. I didn't find it. I didn't find Tim in the same league. And even when he gets the mask, he really doesn't do much with it. He only puts it on one time and once towards the end. Uh, and then even the makeup on it, it looks really cheap. Like, it doesn't even look like J.B. Kennedy's face is going through it. Like, with the original, I saw Jim Carrey's face through that mask. That was Jim Carrey's face going through it. Here, though, it just looks like a double. It looks like a cheap Halloween mask that was plastered on his face and with this cheap-looking hair right here uh, in the front that they coated with makeup to try and hide its fakeness, but it shows. The original mask just looked more realistic, and Carrie just felt like he was in the mask, as I said, and the makeup looked much better on him, unlike this. But again, I'm not putting this all on Jamie. It's just he was the wrong choice to replace Jim Carrey. And honestly, I don't think anybody could have replaced him. So honestly, it was a wrong choice entirely to replace him. His wife, played by Trailer Howard, I don't remember much. He didn't leave much of an impact. It was a Cameron Diaz. And that's one of the few roles I didn't really mind her in. Or in other Charlie's Angels where you get a nice scene of her dancing in her underwear. That was, that offered a lot. Um, that's one of the few roles I didn't mind her in. her in. This girl just didn't offer much, and she isn't even in the film that much. In the middle, she leaves to be a part of this business trip. It doesn't come back till the end. 
the other actors and actresses aren't much and just feel like they're there to collect a paycheck because everybody doesn't seem to have any character other than a name. Even Stephen Wright, who looks like he doesn't even want to be there, 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 doesn't even want to be there. And this is the guy who, who looks like he doesn't want to be there, there, or anywhere for that matter, doesn't even want to be there. So, yeah. The only two I actually liked, and I'll be honest, Bob Hoskins and Alan Cumming as Loki, and Bob Hoskins as Odin. Probably because these two are having a lot of fun with these characters. And yes, they're playing them over the top, but they're at least giving it their all. And both are great actors, so I can at least give us some lead way. Give credit where credit is due. Like, the parts of them yelling at each other with him going into him and saying, like, I'll open up a can of lightning on you, or giving him shit. Uh, but I had no problem with them. But the last thing that tops this shit cake is the effects. And boy, they look awful. The CGI is used about as much as a fat guy using a refrigerator. It's practically used everywhere in this movie. Creating these weird and creepy images that are supposed to come off as cartoony and cute, but look creepy. It looked like someone in an asylum took over and did the effects. And they look awful. A lot of them do. I will say... Otis, when he's in the mask, that that portion of the effects look fine. He's even voiced by Richard Stephen Horvitz, the voice of Invader Zib. And he's going to be a destroy all humans. And he does fine. But the effects, for the most part, that are used, they look weird and they look awful. The scenes of the baby running up and down, down, making these faces, running up the walls. walls. It just, it looks creepy. And what should I say creepy? It looks weird. There's even a point where a baby, the baby grabs Tim by the legs and starts throwing him around. They have to CGI J.B. Kennedy be thrown around. It's unbelievable how bad it looks. This is a clear example of how CGI can get when there's no limit, how bad it can get. At least the first film wasn't just about the CGI. They actually used practical effects. And that was 94. This is 2005. There is no excuse for how bad this looks. But yeah, the CGI is terrible. Uh, bull. And just the moments of the baby, like, with Otis being pulled out and what that, um, um, or like the part with the eyeballs coming out of the head. It's like, what is going on? But yeah, this movie sucks. And I feel bad for the children who went to see this in the theater. Children deserve better. Even though I'm one of the few people who likes the Dumb and Dumber Er pre movie, or Dumb and Dumber Er, uh, I'll watch that over this. Um, this is a clear example. This was a clear example of a prequel done well to me. This is a clear. Ex this movie right here is a clear example of a sequel done horribly without the original team. Do yourself a favor, don't go see this, don't see this film. Just go out and get a copy of the DVD or the VHS of the original and watch that. Or if you've never seen it, it, it I definitely recommend checking it out. Just avoid this movie. Even if you say it in the bargain bin, stay away. <sighs> when it comes down to it, I give Son of the Mask a 1.5 out of 10. It is garbage. Don't see this movie. It is a piece of trash that shouldn't be watched by anybody buddy, or viewed by any children. It is just... Oh, there are no words to describe it. I, I urge... I have a warning letter to give. Don't see this movie. It'll benefit you. You can save it up for good Good games and good movies. Like, I got some good games and movies right here that I'll show in an update. The list is growing. Got some more coming in, which I'll show once I get, let's say, calm. But, yeah, that's my review for Son of the Mask. And next time I'm going to do a review on Doom 3, Resurrection of Evil. I'll get my thoughts on that later. But, anyway, I'll see you guys later. Let me know in the comments below what you guys think of Son of the Mask. Uh... Do you guys like the film? Are you guys one of the few people who like it? You know what? I might go watch this. I might go watch this in the original. I, I'm I'm look 
Maybe it'll wash the bad taste out of my mouth. You know what? That's exactly what I'm going to do right now. I'll see you guys later. See you guys next time. Be sure to rate, comment, subscribe. I'll see you guys later. Bye.